and happy National Fossil Day. My name is Anne and I'm the paleontologist for Grand Canyon National Park. Today, I'm going to talk about some really cool fossils from the Paleozoic rocks of Grand Canyon. Now, before I talk about the fossils, we've got to understand the geologic context first. Now, imagine cutting into the Grand Canyon like a cake and cutting out a slice of that cake. This is sort of what that slice would look like, showing each layer of rock in the Grand Canyon. Now, the oldest rocks are going to be at the bottom here, starting with the crystalline basement rocks. Um, they used to be ancient mountains over billions of years ago. And on top of that is the supergroup, um, which contain rock layers over 1,000 to 700 million years old. Now on top of that sits the horizontal Paleozoic rocks. Now I'll focus on these rocks since they are the ones that contain the majority of fossils in Grand Canyon. Now I'll be talking about body fossils and trace fossils, so it's important to understand the difference. Now a body fossil is essentially the fossilized remains of an organism after it dies. So with a body fossil, you can study the anatomy of the organism and that helps to classify them. Now with a trace fossil, it is essentially a record of the interaction between an organism and the sediment it was walking around in. So with trace fossils, you can study the behavior of an organism when it was alive. Um, just like this locomotive trace where it shows a horseshoe crab walking along the sand and its footprints are left behind. So its footprints are the trace fossil, whereas the body fossil is the horseshoe crab itself. Um, now, ichnology is the study of trace fossils and trace fossils are classified a bit differently than body fossils. They're classified based on their behavior. Um, the behavior that they represent. So that's going to be a completely different classification than body fossil classification. Now, since I'm focusing on the Paleozoic, I'm going to start at the lowest formation and work my way up to the youngest one. So we're going to start at the oldest, which is the Cambrian period. And this is the Tonto group that represents the Cambrian period in Grand Canyon. Um, the Tonto group is about 510 to 500 million years old, and it consists of three different formations, the Tapit Sandstone, the Bright Angel Shale, and the Muav Limestone. Now, I'm going to focus on the Bright Angel Shale since it contains the majority of Cambrian fossils here. So this is what the Bright Angel Shale looks like in the canyon. Um, you can see that it forms somewhat of a slope with a few exposed cliffs. Um, but when you look at the rocks closer up, they can actually be quite beautiful and colorful, just like this picture here. Now, the Tonto group represents a, a very shallow ocean. And this is sort of um, the shallow ocean that we envision as paleontologists when we think of the Cambrian. And so these are the types of creatures that were roaming around in this ocean at that time. So here's an example of some of those creatures. Now these are trilobites. Now trilobites are an extinct group of marine arthropods that were among the earliest organisms to appear in the fossil record, and they were the first organisms to develop eyes. So here are just some examples of the trilobites we find in the Bright Angel Shale. This one up here is sort of the larger ones that we find, Glossopleura mckeei. Um, here are some smaller ones called Amaniella basilica. And these are just a few of what the type of trilobites that we actually find. Now here are trilobite trace fossils. Now some of the trilobites that we just looked at could have made some of these trace fossils. Cruziana is a common trace fossil that represents a trilobite moving along the sea floor. Um, each of these lines or striations uh, represent the trilobite appendages as it's moving 
and burrowing in the sediment. Um, Rhizophycus is another common trace um, resembling a trilobite resting in place in the sediment. Um, so the trilobite would sink its legs into the sediment and burrow in place until it's completely covered, except for maybe its eyes, so that it can see what's going on. Um, it may do this to take refuge during a storm or potentially to hide from a predator. Now here's another trace fossil that we find in the Bright Angel Shale. Um, this one is an arthropod trackway. So essentially an arthropod was walking along the surface of the sea floor and made these footprints. Um, an example of what might have made this is this arthropod called Tigopelt gigas. And we know that Tigopelt, it wasn't a trilobite, it was similar to a trilobite, um, but it was a soft-bodied um, benthic arthropod, meaning that it spent all of its time on the sea floor and it didn't have eyes. And so this is the sort of um, trace maker that could have made these footprints. Um, we don't have the body fossil found in the Bright Angel Shale, but we have the potential tracks to say that this arthropod may have been around at this time. Now, similarly, here's another trace fossil that essentially shows um, a series of parallel lines or striations um, where some sort of creature in the ocean must have swooped down to the seafloor and scraped the sediment. Um, and based on the sizing of these striations in the trace fossil, it's possible that a creature called Anomalocaris kenandensis could have made it. Now, Anomalocaris was a great predator during the Cambrian period, and it was known to swim around and catch prey along the seafloor. So it could have created this trace as it was picking up a trilobite or a worm with its large frontal appendages um, and probably scraped the seafloor as it was doing that with um, these sort of spikes that come out of its appendage. And again, we don't have body fossils of Anomalocaris in the Bright Angel Shale, but it's possible that the trace fossil tells us that it may have existed here as well. Now, just this summer, our research group found the specimen in the Bright Angel Shale. And so far, we actually think that it could be some type of anomalocarid appendage. So it would have been a smaller one than the one I just showed you, of course. Um, but it potentially adds to the evidence that Anomalocaris was around during the deposition of the Bright Angel Shale. So we have yet to study this specimen a little bit more, um, identify it. It may not turn out to be an Anomalocaris, um, but that's where we're leaning towards at the moment. So hopefully we'll get some updates to this in the future. Now this is what Anomalocaris um, might have looked like in the Cambrian Oceans. And so it was pretty big compared to the other creatures. It had its big appendages to use to catch prey. Um, very ferocious. One might call it the dinosaur of the Cambrian. All right, we're going to jump right into the Redwall limestone. So we're moving up through geologic time. We went from about 500 million years to now 350 million years in the Redwall limestone. Now, this is what the red wall looks like in the Grand Canyon. It makes up most of Marble Canyon, um, and it often forms this major cliff that appears red, but the rock itself is actually gray in color. So the red appearance just comes from uh, iron oxidation, similar to a rusty nail. And the red wall limestone also represents a vast ocean, only this ocean was slightly deeper with different kinds of creatures. So these are some of the fossils we find in the red wall, um, corals. And these are very similar to the corals that you think of today. Um, there's different kinds of corals that you can see here. 
um, but they all represent um, similar to the kinds that we see in modern day times. Another fossil we find in the red wall are fenestrate bryozoans. Now a bryozoan fossil is somewhat like an old abandoned apartment complex in which all these millions of individual organisms once lived together. And so each apartment in this whole apartment complex um, is called a zooachium. And it housed this tiny little organism called a zooid. And these zooids were no bigger than one millimeter. And each zooid pops out of its apartment, just like this picture shown here. These are the individual apartments or zooachium. And the zooid pops out here to filter feed on plankton or other microscopic organisms floating by um, using its tentacles to bring the water to its mouth. And so these are the fenestrate bryozoan and each of these zooachium are represented in these little sort of bumps that you see here in the fossil. Here's another interesting fossil. Um, now these are called nautiloids, but these nautiloids are quite rare because they are orthoconic, meaning that they are long and straight, as you can see here. And this is different than the typical coiled nautiloid that we think of. Um, now each of these uh, chambers that are separated by septa um, are made of calcium carbonate and they were used to control the buoyancy of the creature. So it allowed the creature to float through the water and catch prey with their tentacles um, and they could even move fast or slow depending on where they move the water versus air within their chambers. And this is um, the fossil that we find in the red wall formation. You can see this is a regular ruler, so this is quite a big fossil. Now, jumping into the Pennsylvanian Permian periods, um, we're going to sort of lump together the Supai group and the Hermit formation. So we're at about 320 to 280 million years old. And the picture on the left shows what the Supai group looks like in the Grand Canyon. And it consists of four separate rock formations. Um, and then on top of that is the Hermit Formation. And the picture on the right shows what the Hermit Formation looks like um, as far as what the rocks are at, actually look like. Now this is what um, all of those rocks sort of represent as far as the paleo environment. We had a coastal terrestrial environment, um, lots of rivers and swamps and um, coastal regions um, containing many different kinds of extinct plants. Um, insects started to show up. We get reptiles. Um, many different creatures are represented in the rock. So starting with the Supai group, um, the Manacacha formation is one of the lower formations at about 313 million years old. And this is a picture of me sitting next to a reptile trackway that was found in the Manacacha formation. Now this was studied and there's a scientific paper on it. Um, we do know that there are other trackways within the Supai group um, that may be older than this, um, but this is technically the oldest vertebrate trackway that's officially been reported from Grand Canyon. Um, so it's, it's pretty exciting and we're hoping to find more in the future. Now I'm gonna dive into the Hermit formation because the Hermit really contains um, a lot of the really interesting fossils uh, that we like to talk about. Um, so starting with some of the insects we find, this is a dragonfly wing, and it's called Typus whitei. And this is the rendition of what the dragonfly might have looked like um, about 280 million years ago. Now keep in mind that this scale bar here is only a centimeter. So this wing was very large. This dragonfly had to have been extremely large. Um, so a lot of these insects were pretty big during this time. 
Now here is one of our favorite plant fossils um, here on the left called supaya. Now these types of plants, fossil plants, are called pteridosperms. They're often referred to as seed ferns because they sort of look like a fern in the fact that they have fronds, um, but they're different from ferns in that they produce seeds um, instead of spores. So they're not actual true ferns. They're called pteridosperms. Now, plants were really important during this time because they released a lot of oxygen, at least 9% more than we have today. Here's another example of a plant fossil we find in the Hermit Formation. These are horsetails, um, extinct, of course. These are called Sphenophyllum gilmorii. And this is actually an extinct um, horsetail, but over here on the right is a modern horsetail, so similar to what it could have looked like. Um, perhaps the leaves were a little bit thicker back then. Um, they kind of look a little bit like flowers, but they're definitely not flowers. Flowers only evolve much later in geologic time. Um, but you can see that the stem actually goes down through the rock. So what we're looking at are these radiating leaves that come out of the stem. It's really interesting. Now, lastly, we have this plant um, called Walkia. And this is a conifer plant, very similar to the conifers that we know of today. Um, and a lot of times we'll even find um, just pieces of the conifer branches preserved in algae. Um, and then this is a picture of what Walkia might have looked like back during the Permian times. Now jumping into the Coconino sandstone, um, I put a picture of the Namib Desert because it sort of represents what the Coconino sandstone might have looked like. Um, it was essentially a sand dune sea. So sand, as far as the eye can see, and we can see that in the rocks with the cross bedding um, of each sand dune. And so the main fossils that we find, or I should say the most common that we find in the Coconino are reptile trackways. And so here are different footprints of various sizes of reptile footprints that we find. And some of them are, are much bigger and some of them are much smaller. Now this one is one of the bigger ones that we've found. Um, it's also been well studied. It's called Igneotherium spherodactylum. Now each of these footprints are about the size of my hand. And it was thought to have possibly been made by an amphibian-like reptile called a diadectomorph. These are sort of what the diadectomorphs might have looked like in the Coconino. Um, they sort of look like these Komodo dragons. Now, in addition, we also get invertebrate tracks in the Coconino sandstone, such as these um, spider tracks on the left or these scorpion tracks on the right. Now, these spider tracks are sort of little divots in the sediment and they have these groupings of four on each side that represent the four legs on each side of the spider. This is just um, a picture of a modern spider. And then over here to the right, um, we have three little divots kind of um, in, at an angle, sort of in a V-shaped angle, representing um, just these three legs on either side of the scorpion. Um, sort of walking at this particular angle. All right, now jumping into the Kaibab formation. Now this is the rock formation that forms the rim of Grand Canyon, and this is the Permian Ocean. Um, this is sort of what represents uh, the creatures in the Permian Ocean. We have sharks, fish, um, cephalopods, even shrimp and crinoids, um, all kinds of different creatures in this ocean. And we're at about 280 to 275 million years at this point. So starting with these rugose corals, um, these are an extinct group of corals. And 
um, they have this radiating septa that you can see inside of the coral. And when these corals were alive, essentially their pointed part where it was anchored into the sediment, the sea floor, and this way their tentacles faced upwards and would take in any sort of um, microscopic organisms um, and feed on them using those tentacles. And now these rugos corals um, shown here represent some of the last of its kind because they all went extinct at the end of the Permian, which was about 250 million years ago. Now, these are sponges, fossilized sponges found in the Kaibab limestone. And um, they sort of have this brainy kind of texture in the rock um, that shows sort of the skeleton of the sponge um, preserved. Um, but sponges are really interesting. They're among the simplest and earliest multicellular organisms to evolve on Earth, and they've still managed to remain successful today, um, just like this modern sponge. Um, and what's interesting is that this, this person is sort of uh, spraying some uh, harmless dye around the perimeter of the sponge, and the sponge actually takes in the current from around it, takes in from its body, and then expels its waste out of the top, which is called the osculum. And so technically, sponges sort of inhale their um, food from their bodies. Um, and I just thought that this video was really cool to show how dynamic sponges actually are um, because they're, they're sort of looked down upon. They're really simple creatures, um, but they're actually really interesting and very cool. Now, vertebrate material is actually not well known in the Kaibab limestone um, compared to the marine invertebrate fossils. And we see just a variation of different kinds of fish teeth, essentially. Um, we have a rounded tooth, uh, mainly for crushing clams. We have a tooth plate that shows individual teeth within it. Um, we have this tooth here that kind of looks like the typical, um, the typical tooth that you might find in the ocean. Um, and then we have this kind of strange looking tooth here called the Megatinopetalus chiababinus. And this is actually what it looks like here. This is what the actual tooth looks like. Um, and these teeth come from a fish called the Petalodontomorph. Now these are a group of cartilaginous fish that are cl more closely related to today's living ratfish. And I have a picture here of a modern ratfish. And these are all sort of pretty, pretty closely related to sharks as well, but they're not quite sharks. Um, now what's interesting about this, this particular specimen is that this fish had these two teeth, just one tooth for its upper jaw and one for its lower. And so each tooth was specialized with the upper tooth having these jagged rectangular cusps to grip prey. And then the lower tooth um, had this single straight razor edge tooth um, so that it could cut through chunks of flesh. Um, so this was kind of a, not quite a shark, but definitely not a fish that I would want to swim next to. <laughs> All right, that concludes um, looking at our fossils today. I just want to point out that if you find a fossil, um, make sure you leave it there. Once, once you take it out of context, it's really hard to study. Um, so if you could, just take a picture of it. Um, get some GPS coordinates if you can. If not, just try to get a good description of where you found it. Um, and email that information to me. Hopefully, I can go out and look for that fossil and identify it for you. Um, and I'll, I'll keep you up to date on any sort of science that comes with it. So um, definitely do that if you find a fossil in Grand Canyon National Park. And lastly, I just want to mention that science, outreach, communication is very important to us. And so you can find us on social media. 
um, Grand Canyon Paleontology for our Facebook. And we also have an Instagram, Grand Canyon Paleontology. So please follow us and you can get more information on new discoveries um, and more. All right, thank you so much for joining me. Have a great fossil day. Thank you.